I'm going to share with you the lessons I have learned over the last two decades and hope that you will get a lesson out of this and you will not make the same mistakes which I have made. In the next 1200 seconds, I hope to convince every one of you that it is absolutely wrong if you do not embrace telehealth. Not in the lifetime of my great great grandchildren will there be enough brick and mortar hospitals, will there be enough doctors. It's going to be impossible to bridge the urban rural health divide. Before I start you on the journey, which I started in 1998, I want to ensure that all of us are on the same page. What do I mean by telemedicine? By telemedicine, I mean the systems and processes whereby a doctor can examine a patient, investigate a patient, manage a patient with both of them physically located in different places. Obviously, this requires hardware, software, and excellent dependent connectivity. Today, modern medicine is all about investigations, and therefore we have images. We need to acquire these images, we need to store these images, we need to retrieve these images, and so on. Obviously, this will require training, we need to comply and adhere with regulations, and so on. Telemedicine, when successful, makes distance meaningless. In fact, geography has become history. It all started in 1996. I had just started South Asia's first stereotactic radio surgery unit and I was secretary of the 2500 strong Neurological Society of India. Common sense and logic suggested that I had a great opportunity to develop this subspeciality. But deep down was a nagging feeling. At the most, a few thousands well-to-do people would benefit with stereotactic radio surgery. Was there not something I could do which could help hundreds of thousands? And then, boys and girls, the story began. As you can see here, it was September the 16th, 1996, when I first heard of the word telemedicine. I had just completed an institute lecture at the IIT Kanpur and at 9.30 at night, a young diminutive gentleman introducing himself as Professor Srivatsan, HOD Electrical Engineering, invited me for dinner at 10 p.m. He was so convincing that we sat from 10 p.m. to 4 a.m., prepared a report and asked for financial grant. Obviously, we were too far ahead of the time. However, on that day commenced a love affair, a love affair which over the last 23 years has taken its toll. My first legally wedded wife, Vijay Lakshmi, but for whom I would not be standing here today, very graciously and most wonderfully accepted the two other wives whom I was married to. The first wife I was married to was really neurosurgery, five years before my formal marriage. And then came the second love affair with telehealth. This is a fantastic example of polygamy being extremely successful. And the third wife ensuring that the first and the second wife took its place. I would once again like to tell you that but for the support of my wife over the last 44 years, I would never ever have been standing here. Looking back, see, I did not have as much white hair as I have now. You had the audacity to do something. 1998, most many of you would not have been born then. The world was totally different. I had the audacity to write to the uh, Rural Association of India for telemedicine. How did it all start? On 24th March 2000, Bill Clinton, the then President of the United States, came to India and he commissioned the world's first VSAT enabled village hospital in Aragonda near Chittur, the birthplace of Dr. Pratap Reddy, the founder chairman of the Apollo group. So this was how it all started. And what happened next? Looking back, it looks very silly, but believe me, the tension which I and my team underwent on this fateful day when Padma Vibhush and Kasturi Rangan, the then chairman of ISRO, the who's who, the elite of India literally were watching the India's and South Asia's first teleconsultation 
through an ISRO mediated VSAT. I was able to relate myself to what happened in Chandrayaan 2. And believe me, though this was much smaller, this was exactly what we did. But then it was successful and the rest, as they say, is history. Se several chairmen of ISRO have subsequently publicly acknowledged that ISRO's decision. Today, ISRO has 400 VSAT, very small aperture terminals in rural hospitals and in super speciality hospitals that was influenced by this first demonstration which we did. Again, I probably am the only doctor who had the opportunity to talk to 300 principals of engineering colleges. Such was my enthusiasm at that time. I tried my best to convince them that every engineering college could provide much better health care than a medical college. My logic was very simple. 6,600 engineering colleges at that time. Every engineering college has an IT department, connectivity, computer science, and in Tamil Nadu, at least 90% are located in suburban and rural Tamil Nadu. If only I could establish a telemedicine unit in 10% of India's engineering colleges, the problem would have been solved. Unfortunately, that was not how it is to be. Now, again, look, looking back to many of you in this audience, this would look silly. I mean, today we, you do multi-point video conferencing on your smartphone. But believe me, in 2001, the very concept of teleconferencing from a hospital was totally unknown in this part of India. No less a person than the Consul General of the United States of America inaugurated India's first medical video conference between Chennai and New Jersey. Subsequently, of course, we had several of them. This is a slide which I often see with great fondness. 2005, Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, decided to make peripheral medical devices. Technologically, they are brilliant, but then they had no idea of clinical validation. So I offered to clinically validate. We wanted to simulate the real world condition. So we went to a village about 120 miles away from Chennai. And you can see here, we got more than 60 volunteers, converted the kitchen of people and used that into an ECG room. And here you can see a 12 lead ECG being transmitted, blood pressure being transmitted to the then available mobile network. It was only 2G at that time. Today we are talking of 5G, but then it was just 2G. Now, here is an example of how adversity can be turned into an opportunity. Ericsson had got special permission for 3G and they had asked me to do India's first wireless testing of diagnostic investigations. With a lot of difficulty, I chose a village about 80 miles from Madurai and we took enormous efforts we put in. I thought I was pretty smart. I went and met the assistant engineer, requested him that I must have power because those days power was a problem. This was in 2005. And I even made arrangements for a backup generator, four hours of diesel I got. I thought I had factored in every possible variable, but I did not take into account the fact that the assistant engineer's mother-in-law could die one hour after I started the procedure. The entire electricity board team went away. I had diesel only for four hours. I do not give up that easily. And as you can see here, I removed the diesel from Apollo Hospital's buses, from the ambulance vans, sent some people to the nearest town, tried to get more diesel, removed all the diesel from diesel cars, hospital van, everywhere, managed to get enough diesel for the generator, which you can see. Then again, the army. Again, as most of you are, I am passionate. I am a great admirer of the armed forces. 2002, the world was totally different. I had, the, uh, I had to operate on the CEO of the military hospital. And I came in contact with the general officer commanding of the Andhra Tamil Nadu area. I literally challenged him and he fell for the challenge. And we set up 16 telemedicine units in the whole of the Southern, Southern Command. You can see here, this was so fantastic, 2002, I had an opportunity to address very senior officers of the Indian Army, and I was delighted. Unfortunately, after the general retired, the telemedicine services also stopped. However, a year and a half ago, the Indian Armed Forces, particularly the Navy, are now embracing telemedicine in a big way. The next slide, as you can see, 
another example of how you need to exploit a situation now here i was invited to address an international critical care congress in 2003 i had made all plans for it but then my mother fell seriously ill i couldn't leave rather than call off the meeting i decided i will give a live demo i went to the our icu unit in apollo hospitals and gave a talk on telemedicine and critical care from the bedside of a patient focusing the camera on various monitors various monitors and so on believe me my virtual talk was far more impressive than if i had gone there physically so what is the message the message i give is that every adversity there is an opportunity it depends on how passionate you are how badly you want to do something the next couple of years there was a lot of travel as you can see i went to all sorts of places kosovo uh, saudi arabia and every single opportunity whether it is a cii or fiki any organization anywhere i became known as an evangelist for healthcare but this did help and subsequently you can see india was literally placed telemedicine in india was placed worldwide we had a distinguished series of visitors the president of nigeria the prime minister of mauritius president of sri lanka so many countries so many delegations everybody came to see what we were doing we were no longer talking theory we were talking actually practically what has happened in 2009 the ministry of external affairs government of india started the pan african e network project and the body language on this slide speaks for itself people in the rest of the world are thirsting for knowledge india is better than the best so far as healthcare is concerned and here you see i had the opportunity to address uh, doctors from more than 15 countries in africa from the comfort of my own department slowly things started improving we entered into tier 2 tier 3 cities we couldn't go into villages at that time but we did make a mark and this is what happens every day at least 100 people tele consultations are given from my department every day in tier 2 tier 3 cities mainly in northeastern india just a few clinical examples this young man is deeply unconscious in port blair andaman and nicobar islands i had been invited i had given a talk there and 3 weeks later the ct scan technician called me and he said sir you are talking so much of telemedicine what do i do i said do you have a mobile phone he said yes and remember that in 2007 or 8 this happened quality of the phones was totally different there was no doctor there it's only a ct scan technician and this smart little technician took a photograph sent it to me and of course any neurosurgeon will immediately be able to make a diag previous slide please any neurosurgeon will be able to make a diagnosis of a small bleeding inside the brain i put him on the appropriate treatment and four weeks later one of the pleasantest moments of my life somebody knocks in my office room in madras with a dozen apples and he says sir i understood that you are the person who treated me from madras this is the power of telemedicine it takes 2 minutes for a neurosurgeon to make a diagnosis and treat it is sad that they are not embracing another example a tanzanian nurse in muscat she comes to muscat as you can see from the picture below this is a condition where multiple tumors in the brain i discussed with the patient exactly what is to be done how it is to be done etc from the airport she comes straight to the stereotactic radio surgery room undergoes treatment you need not touch a patient the patient need not be in front of you in order to see the patient there is no limit to what telemedicine can do here again you can see anybody will be able to say that this person is in extremis obviously is very critical none of you know the agony and the misery which a family occurs undergoes when a patient dies while being transferred from a rural area to a big city taking a dead body across check posts and outposts is something which my worst enemy should not get so i took the full responsibility i said you write in the case record seen by dr ganapati senior consultant of apollo hospitals this patient is not going to live long there is no point in, in sending the patient anywhere and you put my uh, i take the full responsibility exactly as i predicted in 10 minutes he developed an irreversible cardiac arrest i'm going to show you a few more stories to tell you what we went through before i end by saying what we are today 
I have had the opportunity to go twice to Kaza and Kila, 14,500 feet high. This was how medicine, medical care was. A burns patient dragged for 36 hours to go to the nearest health facility. Four years ago, we set up a telemedicine unit and we went house to house, proactive. Today, healthcare is not making a diagnosis and treating. By the time you people become doctors, I'm sure healthcare will be about promoting wellness, making you healthy. I'm sure that in my lifetime, I will say hospitals without patients. That is the ultimate dream. Hospitals should not have patients. The only patients will be trauma patients and advanced kidney failure, brain tumors and things like that. So what did we do? We went to the community. We went to every single house. And with the point of care diagnostic, we detected anemia, blood sugar, and so on. You can see in this video, we had a patient. I wanted to watch the video for a few seconds as I describe it. This is a real life situation. A patient at 14,300 feet height had supraventricular tachycardia. If defibrillation was not started, the patient would be dead. It so happened at that particular time, the nurse who was trained in this was on leave. And a young girl who had never seen a defibrillator in her life was there. My doctors are so wonderful. We have a superb emergency department. So he got a mannequin. He demonstrated to this girl at 14,500 feet height, minus 25 degrees temperature. Never, even, can't even spell the word defibrillator. He told her, go ahead, do this, do this, do this with an ordinary webcam with an through the internet. And the, the girl applied the defibrillator and his life was saved. Today, seven patients were treated like that. Distance is meaningless. Numbers speak for themselves as of two days ago. Now, the very fact that we, I could theoretically have got this slide prepared this morning because we are so highly digital, we have no papers at all. It's totally electronic. And you can see 16,000 patients have been given teleconsultations, 1,100. Again, I'm very happy to say we have published papers, we have presented papers. We are the world's first 24 by 7 tele-emergency service unit at a height of 14,000 feet. Nowhere in the world do they have this facility. We now come to Andhra Pradesh, we come to Hyderabad, and this again, I'm absolutely delighted. Two days ago, we had seen 11 lakh patients, 1.13 million patients have been seen. And out of this, 260,000, I'm not making a mistake, 260,000 fundus images, fundus were examined remotely by 30 ophthalmologists from Chennai and a color printout of that fundus was given from 10 minutes to one hour. I challenge anywhere in the world where you get a computer generated printout signed by an ophthalmologist within 10 minutes in rural place. There are 100 and uh, there are 13 districts. We have 115 centers. We are now doing this on a regular basis. Now you can see how the fundus image is being transmitted from the rural place to the reading center in uh, in Chennai. Yet another public-private partnership project. Again, government of Andhra Pradesh. If I if you could click onto the dashboard, you will see in real time as I'm talking to you. We have 183 centers where people are coming from morning 8 till evening 4. Everyone, the history is recorded completely. And as you can see in the next slide, this is the fantastic number of people whom we have seen. 7 lakh patients, 700,000 patients have had teleconsultations done in primary health centers. Where in the world will you get an orthopedic surgeon, a neurologist, a cardiologist to appear on a big TV screen within two to three hours of your coming to a primary health center? And we have analysis, big data analysis. We have information about every one of them. We are paranoid about quality control. And again, all these 183 laboratories, we have a center in Apollo Hospital, Hyderabad, where quality control is exercised remotely. More than 600,000 people have utilized laboratory services. Yet another major project we are doing with technology is using corporate social responsibility funding. We have screened almost 10 lakh patients uh, in, in these different centers. We hold camps. 
we go to kalyana mandapams we go to schools anywhere where there is place if it's 100 to 900 people are seen every single day three days a week four days a week and we provide real time tele consultation with nutritionists counselors diabetologists and so on i have been with apollo hospital from its inception 1983 most of you know the apollo group as a, a, a corporate hospital group it's a quaternary care hospital not even a tertiary heart transplant no big deal liver transplant no big deal combined heart liver and intestine transplant that is what makes me but believe me maybe because of my white hair today i have the greatest satisfaction of being associated with an organization not for multiple organ transplant but for this today we have touched the lives of more than 200000 people i have a wonderful staff who go into villages you can see here ms swaminathan many of you would have heard of them ms swaminathan research foundation and i get the turn on i get a kick when i talk talavaliya patti tamil la naan pesuren i talk about recognizing the dangerous headache and who listens to me about 300 people from 18 or 20 different villages the number of questions they ask me believe me for mcs neurosurgery and i'm also an examiner for the phd even the phd candidate does not ask me as much questions as these villagers ask when i talk to them about subarachnoid hemorrhage and so on so this is the thrill which we get again the telemedicine has been exciting in many ways majli in assam the world's largest riverine island on the brahmaputra we wanted to start telemedicine there there was no way you could get into the island so here you can see we went on a car the car was headed on a boot and unfortunately i was so hard pressed for time my assistant who came with me took this photograph i'm working on the laptop at the same time talking on a cell phone sitting inside a car the car going across the brahmaputra in a ferry this experience put me in good stead when world health organization invited me for a crisis management as heading a crisis management team remote islands and north of haiphong in northern vietnam to find out why telemedicine is not successful there uh, next slide now we whatever academic work we have done has been recognized you can see here the today apollo telemedicine networking foundation is has been selected as a global best practice for, by the Columbia University. A team of four people came down, spent a week with me, took a documentary for 45 minutes, edited version, and this is being used for the master's degree program in international relationships. So, as an evangelist, we have spread the message, whether it be publications, presentations, dissertations, and so on. Today, just a few kilometers from this auditorium, we have India's largest. 24 by 7 medical response center at the Apollo hospitals. I started all this as a hobby in 1998. In 21 years, the remote healthcare division of the Apollo hospital group has almost 3,000 employees facilitating 4,000 teleconsults a day. A couple of days back, the Mr. Sangeeta Reddy, the joint managing director of the group, uh, put up the small, uh, what you see on the right hand side, announcing that we have touched 10 million patients remotely. The telehealth division has today seen 10 million patients remotely. What is my final message? My final message to all you young boys and girls, I may or may not be there, but you have to be future ready. I am optimistic. We have reached that critical mass essential for a takeoff. It took us 10, 15 years, but the last two years, the growth of telehealth has been exponential. And I would like, before I totally retire from telehealth, before I leave this world, I would be wonderful if I could have a chance to help in providing healthcare to India's first three astronauts who are going to be 400 kilometers above the Earth, orbiting the Earth for seven days. We have already started. We brought out a publication, again, the world's first publication, exclusively devoted to extraterrestrial neurosciences. Neurological changes in outer space, what is going to happen? I'm sure by the time you people finish your postgraduate degree, the aviation medicine of today will develop into a space medicine. And I do hope that some of you at least will seriously think of space medicine as a career. Thank you once again for giving me this opportunity.